Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, and so glad you're here. Thanks for tuning in, spending a little bit of time with me. I uh, I get to interview Dr. Peggy Kleinplatz today, and... She is a sexologist, sex therapist for 25 years and has done research on optimal sexual experiences, or maybe we, she would call extraordinary lovers. Um, she was motivated to look into what it takes to make sex as really as good as it can be, uh, which means shifting expectations, letting go of limiting ideas about how it's supposed to be and really opening up to how it can be transcendent. And she's done research on this and developed it into, you know, a protocol that people can do (laughs) and actually, you know, dramatically improve their sex life and especially make a difference in desire discrepancy to help people that feel little to no desire connect to something meaningful and fulfilling. So I'm excited for her to join me today and talk about her work, talk about what she's learned about what what really goes into extraordinary sex and a little bit about how, you know, you and I can get it, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can get more about that in her book, but she's here to go over the con- the whole concept of what really is optimal sexual experience. I hope you enjoy it. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. Peggy, thank you so much for being on the show with me. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this. I'm curious, what what got you to study optimal sexual experience when so much of you know, the therapy world is, is talking about functioning or fixing problems, not really thinking about making it even better? Well, there are two things. One of them was that Many years ago, about 25 years ago, I had had three clients referred to me for treatment of desire problems in the course of a week. And each of them had been survivors of child sexual abuse. And they all said they'd never enjoyed sex in their lives and they had no desire for sex. And I asked them if they'd ever had an experience where they felt really, really turned on and what was the time in their life they felt the most so. And each said that it was when they were in their teens making out, you know, picture the parents' basement or the backseat of the car, (laughs) yeah, fully dressed, um, no genital contact, and yet it was the most arousing experience of their lives. And right then and there, I started rethinking not only what does sexual arousal mean or a really hot sexual experience, but what is sex itself? And I've spent a lot of my career just trying to revision sexuality based on what is good for people Mm -hmm. rather than what's bad. So I got into the habit very long time ago of asking people in my office about what the best experiences of their lives looked like. But then in 2004... I had this student in one of my undergraduate classes. Her name was Dana Menard. And I kept on saying, well, the research says this and the research says that. And she said, but Cosmo says this and men's health says that. And she was just so 
frustrated the discrepancy between the research and what she was reading about in drugstore magazines that she applied to do graduate work with me. Uh-huh. And we decided to study empirically what people who really were having wonderful sex said about their sex lives. And that was the point at which my path as a therapist and my path as a researcher started to converge. Okay. How do you even define optimal sexual experience? I, I mean, I don't know if we have to start with how do you define sex, but what what does optimal sexual experience even mean? You know, I guess from a yeah, but, framework, but it just, you know, how does that apply to people too? Yeah. I mean, we weren't going to be able to do any other studies unless we found the answer to that one first. Yeah. <laughs> we needed a definition. So we advertised for various groups of individuals and couples who were experiencing really phenomenal sex. We didn't call it optimal sexual experience. We didn't want to use any language that would bias people. So we used, okay. we used words like great, terrific, okay. memorable, remarkable. And we did the largest qualitative research study ever on people who were having really amazing sex, the people we've come to call the extraordinary lovers, mm -hmm. and got them to describe really, really phenomenal sex. We asked them about good sex, very good sex, like super sex, and then the best experiences of their lives so that eventually we knew that they were all on the same page by the time they got to like the best. Okay. And then after interviewing 75 people for an hour and a half, two hours, we had like thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts. We got a research team together and analyzed all their findings until we came up with an empirical definition that turned out to be made up of eight components, regardless of whether we were talking about young people, old people, men, women, able-bodied, disabled people, kinky, vanilla, LGBTQ, or straight. The components that made sex the best were the same for everybody. Ah, and, and no matter what they were doing with their body parts too, I assume? Yeah. Okay. Which for us was pretty mind-blowing. Yeah. So what are these eight components? Well, the first and probably most predominant of them was being totally absorbed in the moment being completely and utterly embodied during sex. And a lot of people who've read this stuff, which we first published over 10 years ago, said, oh, yeah, you know, like mindfulness. We say, no, 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 not the level of mindfulness that people learn in weekend workshops. This is a wholly different level. This is being so completely and totally absorbed in the moment that a atom bomb could drop and you wouldn't notice. Mm. And then the second one, is being connected to your partner or partners, as the case may be. Right. Being really aligned with the other person. And it was funny because a lot of people said, you know, we don't have enough language for this in English. And so they kept borrowing language from physics. And they would talk about conductivity between us or electricity mm. between us or surrounding us. And if you start thinking about where this gets interesting, it's, Okay, well, even if those are just the first two, forget the other six, how are you to be completely embodied within while also completely <laughs> connected to another person yeah, at the right. same time? Yeah, that's a lot going on, right? <laughs> yeah, and then the third one was deep sexual and erotic intimacy, which was about trust and mm -hmm. really caring about the other person, uh, caring that the other person got at least as much pleasure as you did. Love, though most people tended not to use the word love. Um, it was as if that was too simple a word in a language that uses I love ice cream and I love my dog for the same yeah. I love you. So they talked about really, really deep liking and appreciation and respect for the other person more than they used the word love, but it sure sounded like love to me. Okay. And then the fourth was high levels of empathic communication, hmm. being able to feel into the other's space whether through words, that is, speaking and listening, but really listening, 
or more often through touch. So being touched so as to let yourself be felt through somebody's hands, metaphorically being penetrated in the way you're letting yourself be touched, as well as touching someone so that you can feel into the other space. So if you want to think of the opposite of this, you know the way your body tenses up when you're sitting in a doctor's office in a cold paper gown and your doctor's about to examine you or give you a shot? Yeah. And every fiber of your body is like all tense. Right. No one who's touching you that way could ever really feel anything because every muscle in your body is tight. Yeah, yeah. So this is about empathic communication where you can touch someone so that you can get under their skin. Mm. You know, I'm sort of hearing Frank Sinatra in my head singing, right, I've right, got right. you under my skin, or Nina Cherry's version. So that's the fourth one. And then the fifth, no, that's the fifth one. And then the sixth one is about fun, laughter, exploration, mm. and interpersonal risk-taking. So in my field of sexology, usually when we talk about risk-taking, we're talking about how to prevent bad stuff. You know, like unwanted pregnancies or STIs or sexual assault. This is a whole other kind of risk-taking. This is Mm -hmm. where a lot of our participants talked about, like, jumping off cliffs together while still holding hands, going on a voyage of self-exploration via sex. Mm -hmm. So fun risk-taking, scary risk-taking, but good risk-taking. Right, right. And the next one was about... Genuineness, authenticity, transparency, being yourself with another person, being true to yourself. And then the seventh is really about letting somebody see that. So vulnerability and surrender while emotionally naked. Mm -hmm. So being emotionally naked together. And then if you take all of those seven, what you often end up with was what we found to be the eighth, transcendence and Mm -hmm. transformation. It was really interesting because some of our participants at the beginning, when we said to them, you know, we're here to learn from you, they said, well, you know, what definition of great sex are you working with? And we'd say, we don't know. We're we're here to learn from you. Exactly. Yeah. And they'd say, so like, do you want to hear like the down and dirty stuff? Or are you looking for the touchy-feely stuff? We said, we don't know. We, we want to hear whatever you want to reveal. And they said, well, get ready, because we're going to tell you about the down and dirty. <laughs> We'd say, okay. And then an hour later, they'd be saying, and then I felt I was receiving a gift from God, and I felt transcendence, and this great blessing. It's like, okay, whatever you say. I mean, now I get curious about all your subjects. And it, did most people have these kinds of experiences consistently, like easy access to this their whole life? Is this something that they only got to in their sixties? You know, after all, you know, decades of sort of unsatisfying sex. Like, to you know, what did people need to get there? What was their? I don't know. Is this something if they could have this, they had this pretty consistently, or was this the rare outlier for them? Great question. We asked everybody that question. We asked them, you know, were you just born lucky? Did you start having sex this way? First time you had sex? And they all cracked up laughing and they said, (laughs) you know, when when I was in my teens, I thought getting laid was great. Right. When I was in my 20s, I thought getting laid without my parents walking in was really great. When I was in my 30s, I thought getting laid without the kids walking in was really great. Mm Mm-hmm. But by the time I got to my 40s and 50s, it was like I was scratching my head saying, is that all there is? Is that it? Is that as good as it's going to get? And so I started to look at myself in the mirror and really think about how honest I want to be about what I really want. And was I willing to be emotionally naked enough to tell people? And so we asked, well, what was the average age at which this started in your life? And the average age was midlife. Like, Mm -hmm mid-50s, which really depressed the members of our research team because none of us had hit 50. <laughs> and we're saying, like, yeah, but, but the good stuff's all in front of you, right? <laughs> yeah, but I had, you know, undergraduate students who were 20 years old saying, so I have to wait another 30, 40 uh, years for this to start? Right, right. And I said, as their fearless leader, well, that's an empirical question. We'll eventually get to doing the research to find out if any old person can have sex or if even any young person 
can mm-hmm. have sex of this caliber? And if so, what do they have to do? So when we asked everybody, so what did you have to do in order to get to the place where you could start having this? Everybody said their first answer was always, I had to unlearn everything I'd ever learned about sex growing up. Hmm. I had to take every myth and stereotype and reject them, eject them and reject them before I could find out what it was going to take to have sex like that. Hmm. So what were there common things they had to unlearn? I mean, you know, specific, or is it just the whole gamut of, of th- messages we get? Both. So some of the specific things they had to learn was, in fact, that great lovers are made, not born. Mm. So if they were going to become what we've now come to call extraordinary lovers, it would take effort. Uh, it wasn't just going to happen. And so another of the really big myths is that sex should be natural and spontaneous. Yes. <laughs> that was one of the huge ones that everyone had to unlearn. Because yeah. let's face it, if we watch mainstream movies or we're reading romance novels or we're watching porn, everything looks natural and spontaneous. You're right. And right. It, yeah. So in therapy, people would say to me, you know, I don't understand what's wrong with us. When we were first together, Every time we saw each other, we had sex. And it was always natural and spontaneous. And so I learned to unpack that myth and say, uh, wait a minute, was it really natural and spontaneous? Like you came home from work and then you went to the gym and did you go straight into sex? Well, of course not. Okay, well, what did you do before you had sex? Well, after working out at the gym, I would you know, take off my gym clothes and get rid of the underwear with the fraying elastics that was going kind of grayish and then I would shower and I would shave and I would groom and put on some cologne or aftershave and I'd you know put product in my hair and put on the kind of underwear that would make me feel attractive to myself oh yeah and I'd have to hide all the dirty laundry (laughs) and maybe just hide the dirty dishes. They don't have to necessarily right. do the laundry in the dishes, but I have to make the place look presentable. And of course, we called or texted each other during the day to sort of prime the pump and to say, I'm thinking of you and can't wait to see you. And so, so you spent six hours planning yeah. to make it look natural and spontaneous. Yeah. And once you're in a long-term relationship and sharing the same place, you can't fake natural and spontaneous anymore. You're going to have to show your effort. Right. But it's like our grade nine math teachers said, what's wrong with showing the effort? It's a way of saying, you know, I'm, I'm interested enough in having sex with you so that you're going to see how much effort I put into being with you so that when everything is prepared, then we can be natural and spontaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's similar to things I say to clients all the time. You know, this whole myth that it should just happen naturally, right? It gets, it uh, drags people down. Yeah. Yeah. So all of our extraordinary lovers said that was the first thing I had to do. I had to unlearn everything in general. And then in particular, I had to eject this myth that sex should be natural and spontaneous and I also had to overcome a lot of the shame and guilt I'd felt about my fantasies growing up and, and mm-hmm. be prepared to be much more honest than I'd ever been. Mm-hmm. And sort of the flip side of it should be natural and spontaneous is the reality, which is anything that you really want is going to take time and intentionality and devotion. And it's like, If you go to a McDonald's, you will get a burger that is predictable and serviceable every time you go into a McDonald's. Or so I'm told I'm vegetarian. I've actually never (laughs) eaten McDonald's. But that's what I hear. But so you hear. Yeah. yeah. But this much I do know. If you want to walk into a gourmet restaurant where everything titillates your taste buds and 
it smells phenomenal even before you eat it. And the way the chef has plated it for you, the colors look nice and the fragrances. I mean, that chef spent hours and hours and hours on your meal and spent years learning how to make that meal. So if you want to be a gourmet lover, you're going to have to spend some energy and time and devote yourself to being someone who makes things better than a McDonald's burger. Not that there's anything wrong with a McDonald's burger, I'm told, if that's what you want. But if you want something great, be prepared to put in effort. Yeah. It shouldn't feel like work, but right. effort for sure. Yeah. 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 It's like investment, really. Exactly. Yeah. It's investing in the goodwill of your sexual relationship. Right. And one of the really cool things was, you know, in our mainstream media, sex is only for the young and beautiful, Mm -hmm. able-bodied. And we were talking to a lot of people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who were chronically ill or disabled, and yet were having better sex now than they'd ever had before. So really magnificent sex takes creativity imagination, openness, the freedom to take chances without worrying and making mistakes and being able to laugh about it and saying, well, that sure as hell didn't work, but we learned never to try that again. Let's try something else. What the hell? So if one of the myths everyone had to unlearn was sex is for the young and beautiful and heterosexual and able-bodied and so on, it was anybody can have really magnificent sex. You may need so-called normal sexual functioning for normal sex, but for magnificent sex, normal sexual functioning is neither necessary nor sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you and I see lots of clients who can have plenty of orgasm, but still have low desire. Right. Right. It takes more than that. And it doesn't take lots of orgasms to have magnificent sex. Right. Is there anything else you were learning from these um, extraordinary lovers in terms of things they had in common or their journey there? (laughs) Like what are the, what are the lessons did you take away from these people? Well, one of the really cool ones, well, the the answer is we learned a lot, but one of the really (laughs) cool ones we didn't see coming. So I'm a phenomenologist by training and that means that I'm not interested in studying group similarities or differences. I'm just interested in the experience itself. So anybody that we interviewed, we were interested in hearing about their experience until we interviewed so many people that we we got it. We found the eight components. But there were only two of us, Dana Menard and me, who did all the interviews for reasons of ethics and confidentiality all the other members of the research team, and there were about seven others, never got to see the names of the people that we were interviewing or saw any of the other identifying information. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of the things that was really interesting was that the raters on the research team would read a transcript and they would say, God, that guy sounds really hot. Or, yeah, that right wow. The- have in their mind, right, of who was telling this story. Yeah. Exactly. They had an image. Or they'd say, boy, that old woman's had a lot of experience. Or, boy, that young kinky person is very experimental and adventurous. And Dana and I would listen to their comments and say, what makes you say that? And they'd say, oh, I don't know. It just seemed obvious. Well, the hot young guy turned out to be an 80-year-old woman. (laughs) The really experienced older woman turned out to be a 30-year-old really kinky person. And they got it wrong every time. Right, right. So we ended up writing a paper with apologies to our fellow phenomenologists saying, how do you like that? At the high end of the range of human sexualities, plural, there are no differences between men and women. Mm -hmm. The young and the old at the high ranges are indistinguishable. The able-bodied and 
the not so able bodied, the chronically ill, are indistinguishable. The kinky people are indistinguishable from the vanilla, and the LGBTQ people are indistinguishable from the straight. So we need to throw out all our stereotypes and recognize that when it comes to bad sex, which I don't study, or normal sex, which I don't even know how to understand, (laughs) I don't know how to define it, uh, there may or may not be differences between people. But at the high end, we all look alike in the dark. Hmm. When you glow in the dark, everyone looks alike. Hmm. So that was a really cool thing to learn. Yeah. That the presumed stereotypes are not true. Hey, this is Jess. I'm just taking a quick break, and I want to make sure you know about the guide I wrote about how to talk to your partner about sexual concerns. This comes up a lot in my practice. People have struggles and it takes them so long to bring it up with their partner. They're afraid that that conversation is going to go badly. Their partner's going to be upset. The partner's going to be defensive, or they just don't know how to talk about sex and sexual problems. Common, common problem. So I wrote this guide that really helps you address this. It helps you prepare for the conversation how to introduce the conversation, and then tips about how to actually get through the conversation so that you can change things with your partner as a team. If you are interested in this guide, you can find it at bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Again, bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Happy to send it to you. What did you learn about the pathways to optimal sexual experience? Like what is, are there prereqs, (laughs) you know, besides, you know, letting go of these expectations or what we've been taught and I have to be more honest, but like, is it certain, certain backgrounds, certain attachment styles or, uh, you know, what's, how how do people get there? Yeah. So we did a study for both, seven years that tried to answer exactly the question you just asked. We, it took us a while and we looked at what led to becoming an extraordinary lover. And there were many different factors as well as different pathways. So I'm just going to mention a couple of factors to you and then I'll go into the pathways if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, One of the really important factors, especially now, is consent. Mm. And I'm a Canadian, but my impression when I watch American media and read American media as to how they talk about consent is like, yes or no, like an on-off switch. Right. And our participants were talking about consent and mutuality and communication at a very nuanced level. It's not like, do I want to have sex with you or don't I? But what exactly do I want when I have sex with you this time? And are you into that also? Mm -hmm. And can I share with you more deeply? And can I tell you what I really want? And what would really turn me on today? And it doesn't have to be the same as tomorrow. And they were willing to switch it up. So another one of those myths is, you know, you have to learn the formula and then you repeat. Then lather, rinse, repeat. Right. This is a recipe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And this was not a recipe. Like there are a variety of facilitating factors, but if you're going to move from good sex to magnificent sex, you need a certain degree of flexibility. This isn't about novelty. Mm-hmm. It's about getting to know each other over and over and over in the course of a long-term relationship. So familiarity breeds trust. And trust breeds going higher, going deeper, going Mm -hmm. broader. So lots of different kinds of levels that you can attain over a lifetime together that you generally can't experience in just a few hot nights. A few hot nights are great, but you can get even better than that. Yeah. So consent becomes part of another important facilitating factor 
which is empathic communication. So empathic communication turns out to be sort of like a meta factor. It's both one of the really important components and also a factor that helps you get higher over time. Okay. So it's not just saying a little to the left, please, (laughs) which is hard enough for a lot of our clients. Right, right. But really sharing what it is that arouses you today and how that's different from tomorrow. Mm. So, for example, I see a lot of, I'm going to be stereotypic, please forgive me, and I'm going to (laughs) generalize. I'm going to say mostly heterosexual men who say, you know, well, I finally, you know, figured out what steps to take in what order to get her to come as quickly as possible. Right. And I did it. And she liked that, and I did it again, and she liked that, and I did it, you know, a hundred days in a row, and then she didn't like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah. The quickest way to kill desire is to do what works relentlessly. Yeah. So, like, this is late June, and my favorite dessert at the moment is gelato, but my favorite dessert in February is not ice cream. It's something hot. Yeah, yeah. Like apple crumble or creme brulee or something. But I probably don't want apple crumble when it's 100 degrees out. Yeah. Your body's allowed to have moods and it doesn't want the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. It wants you to keep getting to know the person attached to the genitals. So that if you're really grooving on each other, you'll find new pathways into each other that are deeper. It's not about new sex toys. It's about newly discovering each other. Right, right. But beyond that, there's a lot of arguing in, say, the couples therapy literature about is it attachment or is it differentiation? Right. (laughs) Yeah. And we discovered the answer is yes. Exactly. (laughs) Same thing in the in the therapy world, I think. So, yeah, it's not one or the other; it's both. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not necessarily in the same sequence for everybody. So, how does this so, apply to you know extraordinary lovers? Not the same way for everybody. So, let's say you found yourself in a relationship with somebody where that person's pretty differentiated. That person's really willing to let go in the moment, is extremely uninhibited, grew up sex positive, got great sex education, came from a family that was really able to let that person discover how to be themselves in a sexual relationship. Well, that person's differentiation may trigger the other partner to feel so comfortable and so free not to make mistakes and so secure that whatever they did would be okay, that one's differentiation led to their attachment and that led to optimal sexual experience for both of them. But sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes a person, for example, may have been sexually abused and may have had a horrible sexual upbringing, but the relationship was the foundation in which they were able to develop trust and security and safety so that the two of them could then create new ways of being together, which made it safe to then make their way up to optimal sexual experience. Mm -hmm. So different pathways for different individuals and couples and relationships. And of course, what that means for you and me as therapists is We're going to have to custom tailor whatever we do with clients. We aren't going to have a one-size-fits-all package for therapy. Yeah, just like sex doesn't just go follow A, B, C, D, right? Therapy doesn't either. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I'm I'm imagining people listening to this and words like extraordinary lover and transcendence and I mean, I'm, I'm just imagining that people are thinking, this is out of reach for me. Like, this, I can't even, 
you know, can't even really picture what she's talking about or um, maybe it's only special people that can have this. I mean, how, how do you see this in terms of, is this really accessible to everybody? Well, that was the big empirical question that my 19 to 25 year old research team members were saying, holy cow, I need to wait 35 years. That's not fair. Right, right. And so we decided to find the answer to your question empirically. And it wasn't hard to find the people with whom to answer that question. So as a sex therapist, for over 25 years, I had a waiting list of seven and a half months. And almost, I'm not going to say almost everyone, but certainly the majority of the clients on my waiting list were people who had the most common sexual problems. Low desire or no desire. Mm -hmm. low frequency or zero frequency of sex or the better way to say it is just simply sexual desire discrepancy where one person in the relationship wanted more than the other person in the relationship and they were distressed about it and they were fighting about it and it was threatening their relationship yeah so if that's the most common thing i was dealing with i had a waiting list that went on forever for years and years and years and i would call couples back after six months on my waiting list and they'd say great you call us back now uh thanks we got divorced after five months of waiting Quick. <laughs> i felt horrible so the research team said look we've got all these findings which sound like they're kind of esoteric is is this accessible to anybody or not and i said mm -hmm. well I've got a seven and a half month waiting list. Why don't we start creating a group therapy intervention so that we could get all the clients on my waiting list into groups. And it, we spent several years developing a group therapy intervention to use not even on quote unquote regular people, but extremely distressed people mm -hmm. who'd been on my waiting list and after three years of developing an intervention, we put everybody in group therapy and we wanted it to work quickly. So we set up something that could be done in 16 hours. And after 16 hours of this group therapy intervention, they were now well on their way towards experiencing erotic intimacy. And that meant that I no longer have a waiting list. I mean, if a client calls me today, I'm going to book them an appointment right away. Not seven months from now, but right away. So I can sleep at night because I no longer have a waiting list. It takes a lot less stress off of me. And yeah, it turns out that even people who have really miserable sex lives can change them fairly dramatically, not by dumbing down their expectations, but by refusing to settle for miserable sex. I mean, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, early on in the research process, there's a couple sitting in front of me and I was doing my usual assessment and I was asking them what their sex life looks like. And I didn't say this on purpose. It just sort of I just said it. I mean, I was listening to them describe their sex life. And I said, well, I really like sex. But if I had your sex life, I wouldn't want it either. <laughs> and then I just sort of clasped my hand over my mouth thinking, oh, my God, what did I just say? And they cracked up. And yeah. they said that they felt so relieved and affirmed. And I've come to learn that bad sex, or more correctly, low desire, may be evidence of good judgment. Right. Not right. pathology, but good judgment. Right. So not only is the answer to your question, you know, is this available to more people or just a few extraordinary ones, but it's even available to people who have miserable sex lives. Maybe what we've learned from the extraordinary lovers is if you're unhappy with your sex life, trust that. <laughs> Don't try to force yourself to have bad sex. Right. Aim higher, not lower. Was there anything that came out of the people on your, like I'm thinking about my own clientele and my own wait list and and I tend to think a couple needs at least some respect and goodwill to do this together right like you might you you must have learned did you learn something about the people that either are not ready for this or what they have to have kind of established to start with or um, you make 
a crucial point. So sometimes I'll hear people in my office saying, I love you. And I don't think they're really being honest. I don't think they even like each other. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much mutual respect. I don't think there's much mutual trust. And when they're in conflict, they hit below the belt. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, one of the things that we learned from the Extraordinary Lovers was that they are supremely respectful of each other. And of course, they have conflict, but they handle it in particular ways such that when the fight is over, they feel closer to each other rather than, I never want to see your face again. Yeah. So in our 16-hour intervention, among other things, we're working on relationship factors and trying to create the kinds of relationships that the extraordinary lovers were having. You know, are they going to succeed in doing that in only 16 hours? No. Are they going to be well on their way at the end of 16 hours? Yes. Yeah. But it does mean that they have to learn to be vulnerable with each other, that they have to soften, that they are going to have to learn how to connect with each other, even during difficult times, or especially during difficult times. Wait, here, let me give you an illustration. As it happens, one of the early groups that my co-facilitator, um, Nicholas Paradis, and I were running was a group whereby sheer misfortune, we couldn't have seen this coming, in every one of the couples in the group therapy, one parent of each of those participants died during the course of the eight weeks of oh my gosh. therapy. It was horrible. And Nick and I turned to each other and said, well, what do we do? Do we just cancel the whole group? And of course, most people think of people being intimate when things are light and cheerful and happy. And sometimes that's true. But here were people who were so vulnerable because they were suffering, mm -hmm. because they were grieving. And they ended up being able to connect with each other very deeply because they were being themselves in their grief. And we supported them. I mean, group therapy did not go the way it was originally planned, which was a blessing. We learned from that. Yeah. That we as therapists have to be there in the moment. And lovers have to be there in the moment, even when what they're sharing is sorrow. And if you can be there for each other, for better and for worse, just as it says in the marriage vows, that's when the relationship really deepens. And it was kind of weird, but they ended up on this journey towards optimal erotic intimacy because they were developing the intimacy through the good and through the bad. Mm -hmm. And now I don't want my clients to, God forbid, have to think that you only grow more intimate if someone you love dies. That right. wasn't the moral <laughs> of the story. Right. But it was, you can get closer even when bad things happen. And especially when bad things happen, that can sometimes be when a window of opportunity suddenly opens up. And if you're willing to be there for your partner and really connect with them and not try to just cheer them up, and say, there, there, it'll all be all right. No, if you lose your dad, it's never going to be okay again. You're going to have to grieve. And that grief stays with you. But that doesn't mean you can't find comfort in each other's arms, even during the greatest sorrow. And let's face it, if we live long enough, all of us are going to experience sorrow. Yeah. So how do people learn this stuff? I mean, let's let's imagine all the all my listeners are intrigued. Like, I want to be an extraordinary lover. I want to uh, I want to pursue this. Uh, what's available to people? Well, I think that's my cue as a really lousy um, publicity type of person. I'm new at this. <laughs> saying, well, read my book, of course. Okay. It's so called Magnificent Sex, Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers. Okay, perfect. That, that, that's the cheap and easy version. And it, it should be relatively cheap. I put it in my contract that they aren't allowed to sell it for more than $25 US. Mm. Um, so that, that, of course, is you know the thing I'm supposed to say. So my publisher tells me. <laughs> and it's Rutledge. It's cheapest on their website. Okay. 
But I think you need to take a good hard look at your expectations and be really honest with yourself about whether or not you're willing to put in the effort of being emotionally naked with someone that you care about. You know, sometimes people say, well, one night stands are easy because they're easy. No, it's that one night stands are easy because you never have to face them again in the morning and you can afford to let go of all your inhibitions with someone you never have to face again. Yeah. With someone you're going to have to face again every morning or every morning for the rest of your life, start by being honest with yourself, with yourself. And decide if what you really want in life is a McDonald's hamburger every day, or do you really want something a little more worth the effort? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you're also talking about 16-hour group intervention. This is something that you are training therapists to do, right? Like this is something people might have access to in their communities or... Thank you. I don't even think to say these things. So, yeah, we now have a website, which is OptimalSexualExperiences.com, which lists all the therapists from Seattle to Boston who have now been trained in how to offer this group therapy and are offering it all over North America. And it's part of our contract with the people that we train But there's a social justice element. We want them to offer it at a cost that makes it accessible to more people more quickly. Mm -hmm. We do not want to make ourselves rich doing this. We really think everyone should be able to have and have access to the quality of sex that makes sex worth wanting. There's a lot of bad sex out there. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be. That's that's the takeaway, right? People can have a gourmet meal, not not a fast food. So. Yeah, I mean, even if you make your own food at home, but you then go for a picnic, uh, that took a little extra effort, not a lot of extra effort. Mm -hmm. But on a sunny, clear day, even under COVID, if it's just the two of you sitting out under a tree alone, that makes it special. So, yeah, we're training therapists uh, all over North America or at least we were until COVID. Uh, right. Now it's harder for therapists to fly into Canada because the borders between Canada and the U.S. are closed. So mm-hmm. we're starting to do some of the training online, but the final training, yeah, people really will have to fly into Ottawa. For your listeners who don't know, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. Really, it is Ottawa, not Toronto. <laughs> and we've got our own international airport, just the way Washington, D.C. does. And Some hometown pride in. here, I, I hear. <laughs> uh, I'm not originally from Ottawa. I'm originally oh. from Montreal. Okay, okay. Montreal, which is you know only two hours away, and Toronto, which is only five hours away. But yeah, in Ottawa is where we're doing our training. Um And that means that therapists can go back to their own communities all across Canada and the U.S. and then offer it to their clients. Great. Well, I'm going to put the link to the website and to your book in the show notes so people can easily get get those because I think this is, it's going to be really valuable to people. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm thank- not good at self promotion, so thank you for asking me <laughs> the crucial question. Well, yeah, I mean, my, you know, my, the whole reason I do this is, is uh, you know, it's ideas and it's uh, interesting, but I also want people to be able to do things to improve their sex life. So it's, yeah, I want the action oriented part of this for sure. I really yeah. appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate your inviting me. This has been fun. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, There are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. 
That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.